The Battle of Camperdown was a major naval action fought on the 11th of October 1797 between a Royal Navy fleet under Admiral Adam Duncan and a Dutch Navy fleet under Vice Admiral Jan de Winter. The battle was the most significant action between British and Dutch forces during the French Revolutionary Wars and resulted in a complete victory for the British who captured 11 Dutch ships without losing any of their own. In 1795, the Dutch Republic had been overrun by the army of the French Republic and had been reorganized into the Batavian Republic, a French client state. In early 1797, after the French Atlantic fleet had suffered heavy losses in a disastrous winter campaign, the Dutch fleet was ordered to reinforce the French at Brest. The rendezvous never occurred. The Continental Allies failed to capitalize on the spithead and nor mutinies that paralyzed the British Channel, forces and North Sea fleets during the spring of 1797. By September, the Dutch fleet under a winter were blockaded within their harbour in the Texel by the British North Sea fleet under Duncan. At the start of October, Duncan was forced to return to Yarmouth for supplies and a winter used the opportunity to conduct a brief raid into the North Sea. When the Dutch fleet returned to the Dutch coast on the 11th of October, Duncan was waiting, and intercepted de Winter off the coastal village of Camperdween, attacking the Dutch line of battle in two loose groups. Duncan's ships broke through at the rear and van and were subsequently engaged by Dutch frigates lined up on the other side. The battle split into two melees, one to south, or leeward, where the more numerous British overwhelmed the Dutch rear, and one to the north, or windward, where a more evenly matched exchange centred on the battling flagships. As the Dutch fleet attempted to reach shallower waters in an effort to escape the British attack, the British Leeward Division joined the Windward Combat and eventually forced the surrender of the Dutch flagship Vrea Hyde and ten other ships. The loss of their flagship prompted the surviving Dutch ships to disperse and retreat, Duncan recalling the British ships with their prizes for the journey back to Yarmouth, en route. The fleet was struck by a series of gales and two prizes were wrecked and another had to be recaptured before the remainder reached Britain. Casualties in both fleets were heavy. As the Dutch followed the British practice of firing at the hulls of enemy ships rather than their masts and rigging, which caused higher losses among the British crews than they normally experienced against continental navies. The Dutch fleet was broken as an independent fighting force, losing 10 ships and more than 1,100 men. When British forces confronted the Dutch navy again two years later in the Vleeter incident, the Dutch sailors confronted with superior British firepower as they had been at Camperdown and in the face of pro-Orangist insurrection, abandoned their ships and surrendered en masse. Background In the winter of 1794-1795, forces of the French Republic overran the neighbouring Dutch Republic during the French Revolutionary Wars. The French then reorganised the country as a client state named the Batavian Republic and it joined France against the Allies in the War of the First Coalition. One of the most important Dutch assets of which the French gained control was the Dutch Navy, which had been captured in its frozen harbour in the Texel by French cavalry advancing across the ice. The Dutch fleet provided a substantial reinforcement to the French forces in northern European waters which were principally based at Brest on the Atlantic Ocean and whose main opponent was the Royal Navy's Channel Fleet. The location of the main anchorage of the Dutch fleet in the waters off the Texel prompted a reorganisation of the distribution of British warships in northern European waters, with a new focus on the importance of the North Sea. With the Navy suffering severe shortages in men and equipment and with other theatres of war deemed more important, small, old and poorly maintained ships were activated from reserve and based in harbours in East Anglia, principally the port of Yarmouth. Under the command of Admiral Adam Duncan, the 65-year-old Duncan was a veteran of the wars of the War of the Austrian Succession, the Seven Years' War and the American Revolutionary War and had fought at numerous engagements with distinction and success. 
Standing at 6 feet 4 inches he was also noted for his physical strength and size. A contemporary described him as almost gigantic. The French Navy had suffered a series of one-sided defeats in the opening years of the war, suffering heavy losses at the glorious 1 of June in 1794 and during the Quasia du Grand Hive of the following January. In late 1796, after prompting from representatives of the United Irishmen, the French Atlantic Fleet launched a large-scale attempt to invade Ireland, known as the Expedition Deerlander. This too ended in disaster, with 12 ships lost and thousands of men drowned in fierce winter gales. Their ambitions frustrated, the representatives of the United Irishmen, led by Wolf Tone, turned to the new Batavian state for support and were promised assistance in the coming year by a united French and Dutch fleet. A plan was formulated to merge the French and Dutch fleets and attack Ireland together in the summer of 1797. Tone joined the staff of Vice Admiral Jan de Winter on his flagship Vrea Hyde in the Texel and 13,500 Dutch troops were equipped in preparation for the operation. The fleet waiting only for the best moment to take advantage of easterly winds and sweep past the British blockade and down the English Channel. Spithead mutiny for the Royal Navy. The early years of the war had been successful, but the commitment to a global conflict was creating a severe strain on available equipment, men and financial resources. The Navy had expanded from 134 ships at the start of the conflict in 1793, to 633 by 1797, and personnel had increased from 45,000 men to 120,000, an achievement possible only as a result of the impressment service, which abducted criminals, beggars and unwilling conscripts for compulsory service at sea. Wages had not been increased since 1653, and were usually months late. Rations were terrible, sure leave forbidden and discipline harsh. Tensions in the fleet had been gradually rising since the start of the war, and in February 1797, anonymous sailors from the Channel Fleet at Spithead sent letters to their former commander, Lord Howe, soliciting his support in improving their conditions. The list was deliberately ignored on the instructions of First Lord of the Admiralty Lord Spencer, and, on 16 April, the sailors responded with the Spithead Mutiny, a largely peaceful strike action led by a delegation of seamen from each ship tasked with negotiating with the authorities and enforcing discipline. For a month the fleet remained at stalemate until Lord Howe was able to negotiate a series of improvements in conditions that enabled the strikers to return to regular service. The mutiny had achieved almost all of its aims, increasing pay, removing unpopular officers and improving conditions for the men serving in the Channel Fleet and, ultimately, the whole Navy. While the upheaval continued at Spithead, Duncan had retained order in the North Sea Fleet at Yarmouth by the sheer force of his personality. When men from his flagship, HMS Venerable, clambered up into the rigging and roared three cheers in a prearranged signal for the revolt to begin on the 1st of May, Duncan initially threatened to run the ringleader through with his sword. Calmed by his subordinates, he instead assembled his officers and the Royal Marines aboard his ship and advanced on the men in the rigging, demanding to know what they were doing. So fierce was his tone that the men fell silent and hesitantly returned to their quarters except for five ringleaders, whom he admonished personally on his quarterdeck before issuing a general pardon and dismissing them to their duty. The following week, he assembled all of the men and demanded to know whether they would follow his orders. In response, the crew nominated a spokesman, who apologized for their actions, saying, We humbly implore your honor's pardon with hearts full of gratitude and tears in our eyes for the offense we have given to the worthiest of commanders who has proved a father to us. A week later, when a similar outbreak of mutiny affected the fourth-rate ship, HMS Adamant, under Captain William Hurtham, Duncan again acted decisively, coming aboard Adamant as the crew rebelled and demanding to know if there was any man who disputed his authority. 
When a sailor stepped forward, Duncan seized him by his shirt and dangled him over the side of the ship with one arm crying, My lads, look at this fellow, he who dares to deprive me of command of the fleet. The mutiny evaporated almost instantly, nor mutiny despite his initial success. Duncan was unable to retain control in the face of a more widespread revolt on 15 May among the ships based at the Nor, which became known as the Nor Mutiny. Led by a sailor named Richard Parker, the Nor mutineers quickly organized and became a significant threat to water traffic in the Thames estuary. Duncan was informed that his fleet at Yarmouth might be ordered to attack the mutineers and, although reluctant, responded. I do not shrink from the business if it cannot otherwise be got the better of. When rumours of the plan reached the fleet at Yarmouth, the crew of Venerable also expressed their distaste with the plan, but reaffirmed their promise of loyalty to their admiral whatever the circumstances. News then arrived that the Dutch fleet under a winter was preparing to sail, and Duncan's fleet was ordered by Lord Spencer to blockade the Dutch coast. Duncan issued orders for the fleet to weigh anchor. But the men disobeyed and ship after ship overthrew their officers and joined the mutineers at the Nore. Eventually Duncan was left with only his own venerable and Hotham's adamant to contain the entire Dutch fleet. Duncan later wrote that, To be deserted by my own fleet in the face of the enemy is a disgrace which I believe never before happened to a British admiral, nor could I have supposed it possible, or where that the escape of the Dutch fleet into the North Sea at such a vulnerable time could be disastrous for Britain. Duncan maintained his position off the Texel for three days, during which the wind was ideal for a Dutch foray, and he disguised his two vessels as different ships on each day and ordered the frigate HMS Sirs to make a flurry of nonsensical signals to a fictitious British fleet beyond the horizon. He was subsequently joined by two additional ships, HMS Russell and Sands Parade, and on the fourth day, with conditions still perfect for the Dutch, he anchored his squadron in the Mars Dieppe Channel and gave orders for them to fight until their ships sank, thereby blocking the channel. In a speech to his men, he announced that, The soundings are such that my flag will continue to fly above the water after the ship and her company have disappeared. The expected attack never came. The Dutch army that was to have joined the fleet was not prepared, and Duncan's misleading signals had successfully convinced de Wind that a large British fleet waited just beyond the horizon. The wind subsequently changed direction, and, on the 10th of June, six more ships joined Duncan's squadron from the Channel Fleet, and, on the 13th of June, a Russian squadron arrived. While Duncan had been at sea, the Nor mutiny had acrimoniously fallen apart under blockade by government forces, cut off from food supplies and with public support decidedly against the mutiny. Parker issued threats that the ships under his control would be handed over to the French government. Fighting subsequently broke out between the radical leaders and the moderate majority of seamen, and the ships gradually deserted Parker and returned to their anchorages, so that by the 12th of June only two ships still flew the red flag of the mutineers. Eventually, the last rebellious ship, Parker's own HMS Sandwich, surrendered on 14 June.